process this year has been amazing. We had 36 schools involved, 24 Rotary Clubs, 44 students gave speeches at mid-level contests, and we estimate that the number of high school students exposed to the four-way test through speech classes and so forth exceeded 1,000. And so, I'm Bill Flutley, Chair of the uh, Speech Contest Committee. Uh, just to let you know how this is going to work, uh, we will not introduce uh, either the students or the judges until after the speech contest, at which time those introductions will happen. Uh, and also while the judges are doing their final computations, uh, we'll also be inviting um, the essay contest winner to give her uh, essay for us and Dick Brown will introduce her at that time. And so we have the chance to see six uh, students uh, give both speeches and their essay uh, this morning. And I think you're going to be amazed as we are every year by the quality of, of the speaking and of the thoughts that these young people have. The coming of age, the turning point of the adolescent, in which adulthood is achieved and childhood is left behind. Yet throughout our world and throughout time, there has been no universally accepted age in which maturity is reached and fully recognized. In the United States today, 18, is considered by most to be the accepted age of adulthood. Though as I'm sure many of you can attest, we all know 18-year-olds who are far from fully mature. Similarly, we all know 15-year-olds who seem to have more sense than some members of Congress. <laughs> the rate at which a child grows is subject to his or her environment. Yet our society has adopted specific benchmarks for the unique growth of every child. And these benchmarks have slowly risen as society passes. A male my age was once expected to be working, even married by now. Meanwhile, I'm just worried with whether or not I'll get a date to prom. <laughs> the age at which boys used to join their father's trade is now the age boys still fascinate themselves with video games and sports cars. The accepted age of maturity has risen as society passes, yet these questions exist. When does childhood outgrow its usefulness? Have we as a society allowed our children to become too dependent on the parenting generation? And this trend continues, where will it end? I feel the issue of limiting childhood dependency may be best addressed in the implementation of the Rotary four-way test. The first question, is this the truth? The average youth is highly dependent on his or her parent or guardian for financial and emotional support for far longer than is productive for society. At age 26, a child can still be listed under their parents' insurance, literally listed, as a dependent. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, roughly 30% of adults between the ages 18 and 35 still live at home with their parents. This equates to about 21.6 million adults still living at home. And 14% of adults ages 24 to 35 will continue to live at home. This is a clear example of childhood outlasting its practicality in society today. Certainly cultures that used to embrace the mark of adulthood, as young as 13 in the Jewish faith, 15 in Hispanic cultures, would be appalled to find such a formidable workforce still residing in the basements of their guardians. The age of maturity has risen, and this problem to continue is truthfully a detriment to our society. When it comes to fairness, it's difficult to decide who really suffers from this existing problem. Certainly the parents of a 30-year-old son who just turned their basement into his new man cave would argue the injustice is falling entirely on them. Yet can we really blame the 30-year-old for merely exemplifying a product of his society? Certainly most children make the successful transition from living at home to being on their own, and credit is often given to the parenting. So to the same respect, could the parents in allowing their son or daughter at age 30 to remain at home not be blamed for enabling him or her to remain a child? The reason a 13-year-old can no longer carry responsibility 
is not the decision of the 13 year old to become more irresponsible, but rather the byproduct of a hand holding society. Is it fair to the youth of today to delay the teachings of respectable and responsible behavior until an age in which the parent feels ready? Is this really helping our children? Will this build goodwill and better friendships? I feel this question is best put to the theoretical test of a middle school. For those of you unfamiliar with the incessant pandemonium that is a middle school, let the record show that the collection of prepubescent teens is by far the most ineffective and often demoralizing exposure to social interaction. However, if we compare the maturity of students at that age to the maturity of students the same age throughout history, then the youth of today have greatly progressed socially. Just one example of exceptional maturity from an age that we would consider immature is World War II veteran Seaman Calvin Graham. In 1942, Graham was decorated with many medals of bravery and was earning stripes to his name. But what was perhaps even more incredible than his service was his age. Graham enlisted at the age of 12, was fighting battles, saving lives, and becoming a national hero by the age of 13. This boy accomplished more than many men and women will in their entire lives. And if he is capable of such heroic actions, then certainly the youth of today are capable of raising their own standards. If a current middle school student was capable of respectable and responsible behavior equal to that of a current high school student or beyond, then I cannot imagine goodwill or better friendships could be stopped. And I understand how much like a dream this all sounds. Yet history has shown it is possible. And I'm sure we all can agree that middle schoolers have a little growing up to do. Children crave responsibility at a young age. When a child offers to hold the Christmas tree topper, despite knowing how fragile it is, or insists that he or she presses the call button on the elevator, despite being a foot too short, it shows that every child has the desire to feel as if what he or she has done makes a difference. And this desire does not fade as the child ages. And though many parents with teenagers would argue that their child is taking no responsibility when it comes to household chores and other duties, the desire to make a difference is embedded in every one of us. It can be accessed at any age. To the same token, parents want to see their children succeed. If a child was capable of respectable, responsible behavior at a younger age, imagine the potential that child will have by the time he or she reaches 35 and is certainly not still living at home. Every child will benefit from the rewards of responsibility. And every parent will benefit from seeing their child grow. Childhood is a wonderful time in every person's life. The freedoms and liberties we all take for granted are remembered only through the memories of our childhood. Which is why as each generation spawns anew, the parenting generation seeks to emphasize the importance of childhood to their children. As a child, we can imagine incredible things as a teenager, we learn about the different parts and people of this world, and as an adult, it may seem that the doors to this freedom have shut, which is why the desire to shelter your child's experience from the real world is entirely natural. There comes a point, however, when the real world has to be met, and the youth must be ready. To shelter a child from the difficult truths of reality is to send them blindly into a forest, having never shown them a tree. Our society coddles and babies our children and so they cannot fully really function on their own. This problem truly exists, and to continue is in no way fair, no way beneficial, and in no way builds lasting relationships of goodwill. If we allow our children to remain immature and dependent, then our society will suffer. But if we teach them to have ambition, then we will all grow together. Thank you. I began to believe that philosophy was my life's pursuit. But when approaching my mother with this new proposition, she was less than happy, reflecting the growing trend, not just across our country, but across our world, of the growing de-emphasis of the humanities. A constrained jobs market and faltering economy has forced many employers to choose those with a science and technology background over those with a humanities education. But in analyzing the de-emphasis of the humanities, 
you will apply the rotary four-way test. Is the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Is it beneficial to all concerned? First and foremost, we can quickly establish that the de-emphasis of the humanities is most definitely the truth. In fact, it's been going on for decades. Think Stanford University's required reading curriculum for undergraduate students as an example. In 1962, this list ranged of 14 books, from Plato to Machiavelli. Most, if not all, were established literary classics. But in 2012, by stark contrast, the same list has one book. It's a textbook, not a classic, on a function of the brain in our daily lives. Stanford hasn't just gone as far as minimizing the humanities in their education for undergraduates, but they might have completely replaced it with the sciences. But Stanford is far from alone. Harvard is another top school struggling to grapple with the de-emphasis of the humanities and its devastating after effects. Their faculty and student ratios paint a telling picture. While more than 50% of Harvard faculty teach a humanities-related course, less than 20% of undergraduates today are even interested in taking these courses. This vast disparity shows the after effects of the de-emphasis of the humanities occurring throughout our education system, starting even before the university level. For example, my school, Cumberland Valley High School, has a Science and Technology Summit each year held to pique the interest in science careers for our freshman students. But no such efforts are made for the humanities. No creative writing summits or even poetry summits to try to spark interest in further career paths. Clearly, the de-emphasis of the humanities is the truth, and it's occurring in a widespread manner. But after establishing that the de-emphasis of the humanities is indeed the truth, we can also turn to the fact that the de-emphasis of the humanities is not fair to all concerned, because denying special educational opportunities from some students that need it the most the select few who are able to make it all the way through high school, surviving the repression and the de-emphasis, and still have a passion to pursue the humanities at a higher level, often find their greatest roadblock at the college level. With our unstable economy today, many colleges are forced to make budget cuts. And the first thing on everyone's chopping block seems to be the humanities. From curriculum to faculty to directors, the humanities are the first to go, often in lieu of a growing number of science and technology educators and funding. As a result, the humanities are increasingly being minimized, and those who wish to pursue the humanities at the university level find no facets to pursue their passions. And even those with lifelong dedication to the humanities often turn their backs. Clearly, the humanities and their de-emphasis are not fair to all concerned because they're denying educational opportunities from some bright Americans. But most profoundly, we can turn to understand that the de-emphasis of the humanities is also not building goodwill and better friendships. In fact, it might be creating greater divides within our society today. Those who study the scientists and those who study the humanities have never gotten along very well. But especially with the growing key emphasis of the humanities, there's less and less exposure about what philosophers or thinkers really do and really study. As a result, this growing divide is causing scientists to look down on philosophers as lacking empirical data or scientific evidence to back their claims. While those who study the humanities look down on scientists as lacking emotion and empathy, this growing dichotomy is counterintuitive to what should really be going on. Even among my friends, they tend to take a very apathetic attitude towards the humanities. I'm been majoring in mechanical engineering. Does it really matter if I pay attention in high school English? They're not going to ask me about poetry or grammar in the middle of my job. Obviously, the de-emphasis of the humanities is a widespread phenomenon, but the wide-reaching impacts and the negative destructive impacts it could have are only counteracting the goodwill that it really needs to bring. Integrated solutions combining science and the humanities are required in order to make sure that we can solve the world's greatest problems today, from famine to hunger to poverty. 
They require scientists and thinkers to work together and collaborate. But unfortunately, with the de-emphasis of the humanities, this just isn't happening. After considering all these negative consequences, we can reflect that the de-emphasis of the humanities is most importantly not beneficial to all concerned, because it might be leading us down a very dark road. Both Ray Bradbury and George Orwell, in their futuristic dystopian novels, depict societies where humanity leaves behind the humanities in an effort to follow an over-dependence on the sciences. This often causes them to abandon not only their beliefs, emotions, and conscience, but their core humanity and their relationships with others around them. Obviously, this is a fictitious novel, but these two writers' messages still remain true to today because of the impacts of widespread humanities. We still need the sciences today. Of course, in this information age, we're dominated by technology we couldn't have even fathomed would exist five or ten years ago. In order to navigate these dangerous paths, we need the sciences. But that should never, ever mean we give up on the humanities. After all, the humanities are what sparked the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, forever altering the way that mankind views our relationships with our surroundings and other beings. The humanities have sparked millions of individuals across the world to rise up and fight for their rights and their voices, giving power to those who are powerless. Even the rotary four-way test could not exist without the humanities. After all, the humanities are the reason we can question, think, or believe. And the four-way test, these four questions that we pose here today, depend as a moral guide. The humanities are our moral compass. They are to charge us to believe and to lead. There are ethics, telling us right and wrong, yes and no, do and don't. We should never, ever give up on the humanities. So, let's revive the humanities and continue to ask the all-essential question. What is the purpose of our existence? How do we educate? Not just students, but people. Back in the 19th century, progressive education was introduced. Rooted in present experience, it was a new way to educate that promoted problem solving and social responsibility. Is that not where we should be today? Instead, our current modern education promotes memorization and regurgitation. In a world that expects students to have applicable knowledge alongside self-awareness and life skills. Unlike many choices we make in life, education is one that lies outside the realm of our discretion. When we first began our schooling careers, our three and four year old selves were eager to learn how to cut and color, sing all the letters in the alphabet, and begin to read. Back then, we weren't applying the four-way test to our schools, questioning whether or not our lesson plans were fair, beneficial to all concerned. But now, looking back at the 14 years of my life I have spent in school, I do begin to wonder if our education system in the United States is true, or honest, and building goodwill? And if not, how can we change it so it is? Is it the truth? Our education system in the United States is true in its motives, wanting to give the opportunity to as many students as possible to attend school. But where the truth becomes controversial is what education is promising. It gives students hope that the knowledge they are bestowed can advance them in life to a secure environment. There's an unspoken understanding that obedience is directly linked to success. Unfortunately, that's not how it is. In order to give kids an opportunity to grow, they must be allowed to be free and color outside the lines. Respect is important to have children understand, but adults must reciprocate by respecting the student's creativity. Is it fair? Is it fair to expect students, after their primary and secondary years of schooling, to be capable to tackle life's curveballs? We spend our days learning what the quadratic formula is, how to write an MLA format, and what elements make up a water molecule. 
While all of these things could prove to be beneficial in our professional lives, they don't prepare us for life outside the office. We don't know how to take out a loan. We don't know how to prepare a meal or butter bread. We simply are learning to obey orders. It's an applied formula to create the well-rounded student we're all so familiar with. But there's no manual on how to be a contributing member of society. It's time we go past the textbooks and dive into the real life skills needed, such as how to balance a checkbook, how to work in groups, and how to public speak with confidence, something I'm still working on. Will it build goodwill and friendships? Unfortunately, in today's society, students are so often bogged down and stressed in their studies that we don't have a time or a place to spend time with friends. We also have a bully epidemic sweeping our nation, with one death occurring by suicide every 13 minutes in the United States. Schools can't be entirely to blame for this. Social media has proved to be rather damaging as well. But modern education doesn't emphasize the importance of being involved in one's community or the bond with a peer, let alone adults. We are commonly told that GPA and extracurricular activities are what we're supposed to be focused on, that they're successful, and those are the things we should worry about for college. But I think it's time we reprioritize. Is it beneficial to all concerned? In today's society, my generation isn't viewed as full of potential. We are currently seen as oblivious bystanders to the world around us with a phone in front of our faces rather than another individual or a book. In order to better serve not only the child's future, but the future of the country, let alone the world we will go on to maintain, a new way of thinking is needed. It's time we put a new concept in the spotlight. Self-knowledge. Learning more about who you are as a person, what environments you thrive in, where your interests lie. This will not only go ahead to help the child, but the future of the country that we go on to maintain. Education must prepare a world for the unknown. While it's important to have the knowledge, the facts that will help these children, negotiate their futures, they must have the ability to function within this type of world. Creativity, self-awareness, emotional and intellectual curiosity all must be fostered rather than hindered. It's time we move away from the factual information and towards intellectual understanding. It is in this innovative, creative, and practical education model that we will create a proactive rather than a reactive future. Thank you. The distance from Adams County, PA to Yingting, China is about 8,000 miles. To put that in perspective, the distance from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco, California is about 2,500 miles. So how did I go from one side of the world to the other? I know that at 14 months old, I definitely did not hop on a plane and taught myself of all places at Adams County, PA. Like many other adopted children from other nations, I was simply swept away for by foreigners before I even knew what a foreigner was. <laughs> As I grew up, I became increasingly conscious of how my teachers didn't match those of my parents, relatives, and classmates. These classmates noticed this disparity as well. Starting as early as seventh grade, people began to treat me differently based on how they felt about my ethnic background. I had been shoved in the lockers, pushed downstairs, I told no one would ever date me because I was Chinese. As the racial slurs piled on, I began to wonder whether there are other people that felt the same way. I wondered if there are other scenarios like this. I had to ask myself, does the four-way test, can the four, <laughs> excuse me, does adopting a child of racial minority pass the four-way test? Is it the truth? Parents may go to great lengths to conceal a child's origins if they're adopted. With a child of a different ethnicity, this becomes a hopeless cause. One day, that child will wonder why he or she does not have the same 
blonde hair, blue eyes, and pale skin as others at home and in school. I was raised to have pride in my background, but as my parents often came into school to give presentations on my heritage, my parents never attempted to shield me from my background or the facts, but rather made me aware of it as soon as I could comprehend that there are such things as different races. Growing up in such a Caucasian dominant region, it would have been practically impossible to hide the differences in my physical features. Even parents that may want to keep quiet about the adoption have very little success and then end up confessing to it later in life. So, is it the truth? Yes, this passes the first question of the four-way test. Is it fair to all concerned? Numerous parts of adoption are unfair, but those of a racial minority are at even greater disadvantage. Countless young children are adopted at a young age, relying completely on the luck of the draw when it comes to their adoptive parents. However, with those adopted from a different country, they, may, they are removed from a country where the race may not matter to one where discrimination may be more prevalent. I am in contact with many other children that have been adopted from different nations. I know that there are times when a parent may favor a biological child over an adopted child, or a child of a different or the same ethnicity over one of a different ethnicity. This situation becomes extremely unfair to the child. These children are adopted to have a better life, yet they still face discrimination within their new home. The birth parents contribute to this unfairness as well. You see, they abandon their children when they are young, and these children can be scarred from their experience. Not only that, but not only that, but their abandonment. Excuse me again. Not only that but they wonder why they are abandoned, did the parents want them or not. And also, they have a family history. Despite the fact that I only know a life with my birth parents, I don't know a life with my adopted parents, I know nothing about my birth parents. I still left with, I'm still left with many unanswered questions. Who are my birth parents? Do I have siblings? And most important question of all, are my parents dead? So, is it fair to all concerned? This unknown history can cause me frustration, despair, confusion, consequently failing the second question of the four-way test. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Being of Chinese descent, I can't help but deny the fact that I'm a racial minority. I have started friendships because of it, but I have also had people poignantly avoid me because of the same exact reason. For example, growing up in middle school, people would often hang out with me because I was the only Chinese student or they would not want to associate with me because I was so different. I was not hurt because these people did not want to talk to me, rather because of the reasons they did not want to talk to me. I was based only on my race and rather not, and not on my personality. However, people always have opinions, which is why being adopted from a different nation can both create and destroy friendships. So, will it build goodwill and better friendships? The answer to this question is neither a definite yes nor a definite no. Will it be beneficial to all concerned? The answer to this mainly depends on an individual's experience. For example, based on my experience, the answer would be yes. When I was in the orphanage, I had many health issues, such as pneumonia, frostbite, measles, malnutrition, and a flesh eating disease on my face. If my parents had not come for me, I probably would have died before I turned two. My parents, who could not have a child, and um, got what they wanted, and I was able to live. My father knew an American doctor and called around China to receive life-saving advice on my condition. Being adopted by American parents gave me access to medical services my poor rural town could not provide. In this case, adopted children can benefit from their adoption by receiving services that their hometown cannot offer. However, not every scenario turns out this way. In many cases, there are detachment issues in which a child is emotionally and mentally scarred from their abandonment this can cause an instability in their personality and attitude towards others. Unfortunately, I know several children that suffer from this condition. So, will it be beneficial all concerned? There are many, the benefits of adoption in general and adopting from other nations can vary from person to person. Therefore, the answer is, is ambiguous yet again. Now for the final question. Does adopting a child of a racial minority pass the four-way test? The answer depends on the interpretation and opinion of each individual, or whether that person chooses to view the glass as half full or half empty. I found that for my specific case, 
They pass the boring test. I've been told the truth of my background from the beginning, and despite the fact some aspects of adoption may seem unfair, I have built flourishing relationships, and I have benefited from it. For another person, the answer may be different. However, what can be said is that the core rate has allowed for any person, whether a doctor or not, to find out a new side to them clear in certain parts of their life, such as being an adopted child from a country on the other side of the world. Thank you. This morning, the most important thing, based on time of course, is that I'm the oldest child in my family and I have two younger sisters. But this morning, I'd really just like to tell you about the one. My younger sister's name is Charlotte, and she is four years younger than me, a spitfire, and never in doubt. I can recall multiple occasions where she would answer general questions like, what time does the concert start? Or, where's the bathroom? With complete confidence, even if she had no earthly idea. <laughs> One of my favorite stories to tell about Charlotte is from when she was about two years old. She had just learned to talk, and it was difficult to ever get her to stop. Not that we can now, but that's a different story. <laughs> She would tell us all types of stories, from her experiences with fairies to when she was a puppy, as some of her stories used to start. <laughs> I'm sure by now you love Charlotte almost as much as I do, but this morning what I'd really like to talk to you about is assertiveness and the power that comes with it. Assertive leadership passes the four-way test, and this morning I'd really like to show you how. Most of us have probably heard that you should be assertive in leadership, rather than passive or aggressive, and certainly never both at the same time. But assertive leadership passes the four-way test, and it's something that we should all strive for in our daily lives. First of all, is it the truth? Yes. Going back to Charlotte for just a moment, her stories, while vastly interesting, were very seldom true, even though she could recall them with vivid detail and utter confidence. I believe when we start to define assertive leadership, we should define it as not only being confident, but stating what is true. As a leader in a family, community, or organization, it's important to be confident, but also to state the truth so as to avoid any confusion. Assertive leadership is confidently stating what you know, and it's important to push any organization forward. Next up on our docket, is assertive leadership fair to all concerned? Of course. Leadership is the ability to influence others, but it can be really intimidating when you're put in front of a room and said and told, here, go accomplish this, here's your group of people. Assertive leadership especially gives everyone the chance to have a say in what's going on and to speak their mind confidently. <coughs> leadership is vital to group success, but as a member of some groups and not always a leader, it can be just as important to be assertive when just speaking your mind. Sometimes it can be really difficult to speak up in a group, but think about it this way. You're giving everyone a chance to see a different perspective, your perspective. It gives others a chance to open their minds when we speak ours, and then we get to take our turn and listen to everyone else's ideas. Assertive leadership makes sure everyone has a say, and it politely and powerfully lets everyone be involved in a group. Next up, as our five minutes keeps ticking, is assertive leadership beneficial to all concerned? The answer to this is absolutely. Because you haven't heard enough about my life just yet, I'd like to tell you a story about my marching band season last year. I played the alto saxophone, and my section leader was one of the best players I'd ever seen, and she knew it. But she was also one of the most humble. She really cared about the band and about all of us, and it pushed us to be the best that we could be. We wanted to be good for the rest of our section and for our section leader. As a leader, she pushed all of us to be our best by being assertive and showing us the best way to do our goal and to accomplish what we wanted to see done. Assertive leadership was beneficial because it allowed all of us to be our best while not pushing on anyone else's and all working together. Finally, does assertive leadership build goodwill and better friendships? The answer to this question is absolutely. Going back to Charlotte for one more time, because she's a good example and, quite frankly, always entertaining. She is such a natural born leader that it just amazes me. I can't tell you the amount of times she'll come home from school and tell us stories about her friends or what's going on in her life, and she'll end a lot of her stories with, yeah, well, there was this kid in class, and he was being annoying, so I told him to knock it off. And then he did. 
honestly, she's becoming my role model for assertiveness and leadership because she just tells you like it is. She doesn't sugarcoat anything, but she'll say it in such a way that you just want to agree with her. Her compassion for people is amazing, but she's so confident in herself and what she knows that she'll just share it with you and most people will just say, yeah, that is a really good idea and move right along. I think we should all try and be like that. Say what you think, say what you feel, and do it boldly, but do it out of kindness instead of frustration. And assertive leadership can only build goodwill and better friendships. Thank you so much for getting to know me and Charlotte a little bit better this morning. And I hope you can all see assertive leadership and how it passes the four-way test and how to apply it a little bit more in your daily lives. I'll leave you with this John C. Maxwell quote. Leadership is not about titles, positions, or flowcharts. It's about the ability of one life to influence another. Hi, I'm Christopher Kelly. Uh, I go to Cedar Crest High School. Um, and really, uh, I have a love for, for public speaking for people. Um, in such a, a wonderful topic, or the, the, the four-way test just gave me an opportunity, I felt, to really come out and give my opinion about something. And, you know, as an 18-year-old, my opinion is not normally asked for, so... <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Noah Lee from Cumberland Valley High School. Um, I think my main motivation to come out for this was just to be able to talk about something that, you know, normally I wouldn't be able to speak about and be heard, uh, similar to Christopher, and also just to have a good time and speak in front of people. Hi, I'm Courtney Ritchie. Um, I'm here from Lancaster Country Day School. I chose to do this to push myself outside my comfort zone. I've never been to speak before, and it was just really enjoyable to be able to give myself an opportunity to do something new. And oh, there we go, sorry about that. Um, and like they said, I mean, talking about something that's passionate to myself in the four ways has a really nice job of helping me lay it out and explain. So it was just a really great opportunity. Hi, my name is Michelle Seifert, or better known as Vicki Seifert. I go to Romaine Springs High School and, um, well, uh, my teacher made me do this. <laughs> I really have the confidence to do this. I wanted to go and crawl in a hole as soon as I was over my speech. So, yeah, no. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emma Long. I'm from Central York High School, and public speaking terrifies me, so I do as much of it as possible. <laughs> <laughs> for everyone here this morning to say that uh, each one of you inspires us with your confidence, with your ability, with the excitement that you're facing your future, and we all wish each one of you the best. No matter how the uh, order of uh, speaking turns out with the judges, each one of you has accomplished something very important for yourselves and also for your future. And so we thank you for participating and representing so well your schools and your family. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite you to be seated in here, and uh, we're going to call up Dick Brown to introduce the junior high student who won the uh, district four-way essay contest. And I thought you might enjoy hearing her give her talk today, but she has nothing to do about those. <laughs>
Next on the four-way test is the question, is it fair to all concerned? I am sure that everyone has heard that life is not fair. Certain things, however, can be presented in a way that is not so biased for or against a certain party involved. In other words, it must be able to support one side without completely disabling the other. This part of the test links to mutual respect. Obviously, demanding for things to go your own way or demanding respect without giving it never really works. Even in a situation where one is above another in authority or age, respect is and always will be a two-way street. You give it to get it and you get it to give it. That is fair. I once read a poster that said, fair isn't everybody getting the same thing. Fair is everybody getting what they need to succeed. This is the best definition of fair I have ever heard. Is the topic being presented going to help everyone concerned to succeed? If so, it meets the second standard of the four-way test. The third standard of the four-way test is, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Although this does not directly connect to any of our four sacred values at Mullen Hershey School, I feel that it best fits with positive spirit. By meeting this standard in everything we say and do, we build a more peaceful and positive community, society, nation, and even a more peaceful and positive world. It brings happiness to those around us, even if it may be something that is difficult to bring up or if we are having a time, hard time being positive. This is important to the building of new relationships and a better life for those around us. Finally, will it be beneficial to all concerned is the fourth question that we test. Is everybody going to learn something from what you are presenting through your actions and speech? It is important that all who are involved in a situation can get something out of it, even if it is not any material thing. New values, new thoughts, new knowledge, a new perspective are all things that people should be finding in your actions and words. They are not material things, but they are very important to life, whether you are, fresh, you are a freshman in high school or the CEO of a major corporation. These are the results of behavior and words that people benefit from. These are the results that give people bigger results later and get passed in some sort of domino reaction for people. The four-way test is very important to the development of better relationships and even just better people. I feel that when followed, it will lead to change in the world, and change begins with one person. By one person following these standards, it creates a domino effect of change in the world around us. As I said before, I live by these questions every day without even thinking about it, because of how closely related to my school's values these standards are. I would be that one person to change the world by following these standards in my daily life through both behavior and
public speaking at Miller's Lola University. So uh, I really enjoyed the speeches today. And that's a lot to say because I hear a lot of speeches. So. <laughs> I'm Carl Baskew. I'm from the Sunbury Rotary Club. I'm a retired special needs uh, secondary teacher, and I coached me to Chickalemi High School for 15 years. He's also a past district governor, but we didn't hold that against him. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to congratulate all of the speakers. You did a fantastic job. And if you didn't happen to come in on number one this time, if you're not a senior this year, think about next year. You never know. My name is Paul Burkhardt. I'm a member of the Carl Rotary Club, past president of the club, past district governor. And for 30 years, I was professor of speech at Shippensburg University. <coughs> uh, eight of those years, I was chair of the Department of Speech and Theater Arts. And I've been involved in this speech contest since its beginning, uh, with Ken and now with Bill. So again, congratulations. And I, I wanted a, a special thank you to our entire speech committee, uh, working across many school districts and uh, with uh, many different Rotary Clubs to coordinate this. And of course, uh, Melissa, the uh, district office, uh, helps us to pull it all together with all the threads that are involved there. And we thank her uh, very, very much for that. Now, I invite uh, John Cram, our district governor, to officially present the certifications. We're going to be starting with uh, the fifth place person, and I'll make the announcement, and you can be the you can be the one getting that beautiful certificate. So, uh, and I have pins for everybody. In fact, I have pins for the judges too. I'll give you your pins now from our district. <laughs> Yes, three. Okay, and so I'll give the pin and you give the certificate. And I would personally like to thank the committee for not asking me to be a judge. You guys are terrific. And I want you to look at every one of these people. They have all given a public speech, and you know that butterfly feeling that you had before you came in here? They all had it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so the person who uh, receives the, the fifth place award this day is Michelle Seifert, congratulations.
the district governor ever originally wanted to announce that lunch is next. <laughs> but not for a half hour. Thank not for half an hour. Thank you.